We also have another type of attack called SQL injection. So you have a SQL database in the back end, and then um, that normally helps with querying information. But now inside the username and password box, someone puts a SQL query. What if someone puts a SQL query that says, give me all the username and passwords? If you don't have input validation, someone can put a SQL query. It's going to query the database and give you all the username and passwords. I used to teach at University of California, Irvine, and um, I always demoed that for my clients. We had a lab that we could demo this, and it's, it's possible. There's also a lot of YouTube videos that I can show you how to do that. Broken access control, session hijacking, path traversal. What we want to say that is that there's an, there's an organization out there called OWASP. OWASP has a list of attacks that normally happen against web applications, and it calls them the top 10, OWASP top 10. And then as you can see, I can see that the first attack is injection. So injection is the most common attack that happens against web applications. Then we have broken authentication, that we have sensitive data exposure. There. So OWASP normally evaluates this list every two to three years, and they update it and say, hey, this is the most common thing that's happening around this. So um, you can go into OWASP Top 10 website and then look it up and see what's wrong or, um, or what type of attacks are most common against web applications. Phishing attacks. I believe everyone knows what phishing attack is, right? You know what phishing attack is, Sunil? Yeah, basically, uh, um, sometimes we get uh, some kind of uh, email, right, uh, which uh, says that yeah, you given a lottery or something, which will take us to a bad actor, and they will. Yep. As as we see over here, sometimes you get contacted by email, sometimes by phone, sometimes by text text message. They ask you to click on a link. They ask you to call. So you can be directed to someone or to a system to eventually to the wrong system. They want you to put on your username and password, give them confidential information, pay them and things like that. And um, that's, that's a phishing attack. How can you prevent phishing from happening? The first thing is cybersecurity training. So remember, if you're talking about any type of compliance systems, Compliance systems actually perform cybersecurity training. That's, that's important. You have to teach people that, hey, this is something that might happen and this is how you can protect yourself. Automated link checking and AI-based antiviruses. So if there's a link in your email and there's a software that can automatically check it, that's awesome. That's what we want. So it's going to mark it and say, hey, this is, this is a bad link. Don't click on it. You want to have good passwords? Do you know what a good password looks like, Sunil? What a standard good yeah, password looks like. It should have uh, alphanumeric, capital, lowercase, and uh, numbers and some special characters, right? Which shouldn't be uh, having a re repeated characters or letters. And uh, yeah. What about the password length? Having... Sorry? What about the password length? How many characters? Yeah, minimum mostly recommended uh, eight, but nowadays, yeah, it's uh, even increasing beyond eight characters. Good job. Good job. So normally it was recommended as eight. Um, nowadays, it's better to keep it around 10 at least. So you're right. Good job. Use multi-factor authentication. Use two-factor authentication. So just not rely on a password. Have a um, other authentication mechanism like your, like your biometrics and things like that. Have DNS and web filtering so they can check if the link that is provided in your emails or the request that's going out is going to be like legitimate request or it's not going to a bad website. And then if something does happen, you must have an incident response plan that explains what should we do if we are a victim of a phishing attack. We also have a concept called honeypots. Now the concept of honeypots comes from the idea of studying your bad actors. So if, someone wants to attack your network, what are they looking for? And what methods do they use? And um, how are they approaching it? So you're actually going to create a fake something like a fake link, fake website that points them to specific fake documents. And 
Um, you just want to see who tries to access them. How do they do that? When do they do that? And eventually, after they spend a lot of time, they get to some documents that are useless. But this shows you who your bad actors are and then what they're planning to do. So honeypots are something that are useful and um, it's good for studying. It's good for studying your bad actors to see what they're thinking about and how capable they are. We also have a concept called the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Now, the concept of the MITRE ATT&CK framework comes from um, the idea that it happens a lot that when it's detected in an organization that someone has compromised them, they will figure that out after probably months and months and months of the bad actor already being in their network and having access to their stuff. So if the bad actor had access to my network for a few months, they probably had access to a lot of things. They probably had a lot of time to do whatever they wanted. The minor attack framework explains that, look, if you find signs in your environment, if you find signs in your network that something's not right, then what you can do is to study it. So by finding that sign, you can figure out at what stage they are in. So for example, if I see that someone's constantly scanning my network, my firewall is reporting that someone's scanning you, I would know they're not in my network yet, but they're trying to get in. If I see that their indication that someone is trying to access a specific file in my network that's encrypted, and they're repeatedly trying to do that, that's an indicator that they're in my network. And they're so advanced in my network that they're close to this file and try to break in, trying to open that encrypted folder and file. So the minor attack frameworks is that um, look at the signs, and then they're going to tell you at what stage the attacker is, and then you can take the right action afterwards. So minor attack requires some training. You have to watch a lot of videos, see how it looks like, what indications of attack are there. And then based on that, um, you would be able to take your next steps to see what you can do next. 